All right, everybody, welcome to We Are Libertarians. This is a special broadcast called The Creed of the Freed. It is uh, talking with people of various faiths about freedom and liberty and talking about how those things kind of coincide. I am here today. I <laughs> I am Hody Johns. I'm the host. I'm here with an absolute rock star today. Our very first response when I sent out the emails on these, I, I, I shot high and I went for the biggest organizations. And the United Pentecostal Church gave uh, International gave me uh, David K. Bernard. This is a guy, he has his own Wikipedia page. He's been published. He has 37 books and 39 different languages. He's the founding president of Urshan College and Urshan Graduate School of Theology. Uh, he has a master's and doctor in theology degree. Uh, he went to Rice University. Uh, he went to the University of South Africa. Uh, David Bernard, thank you so much for coming onto the show. I'm sure I missed a million different things in there, but if you'd like to tack on anything that I may have missed, go ahead and let the audience know. Well, now. It, it might be relevant. I do have a law degree, a JD from the University of Texas. Uh, I'm inactive as a lawyer. I'm full time as a minister, but I do have a legal background that helps helps to analyze in a situation like we're like we're talking about. Yeah, we're not supposed to talk about religion and politics, but I guess we're going to do do that right now. Do just that. Um, so le let me start off with it. Most of our audience, this is a new segment, and I think most of our audience is, not, is going to be familiar with Christianity in general. What's something that you would want them to know about Pentecostalism specifically? Well, first of all, you know, thank you for this opportunity to uh, express my views. I appreciate it. Uh, I would say Pentecostals are conservative Christians. Um, the two things that are Im important to us, we believe that the Bible is the word of God. Of course, it has to be interpreted like, like anything else. Uh, second, we believe in a personal experience with God, uh, being filled with God's spirit. And the word Pentecostal simply comes from the book of Acts in the Bible, that after Jesus ascended to heaven, he told his disciples to wait until they would receive the promise of God, be filled with the Spirit. So on the day of Pentecost, which was a Jewish uh, feast day, is when they received this experience. So all denominations of Christianity generally consider the day of Pentecost is the birthday of the Christian church. So the term Pentecostal simply means we believe the same miraculous experience of being supernaturally filled with God's Spirit uh, is available for the church today. So the two things that Pentecostals emphasize, we believe the Bible is true and, and is, it teaches us, and we believe everyone should have a personal relationship with God through the Spirit. Awesome. I mean, that sounds a lot like what I expect from maybe most Christians. Seems like the conservative Christian tend to have, uh, it, it's a Protestant denomination, correct? Yes, it is, but okay. but very distinctive. And you're right, it, it very similar to what other groups would say, except what distinguishes Pentecostals a little bit is the nature of that experience. We, we believe that it's accompanied by speaking in tongues, which means speaking miraculously in a language you don't know. So we believe that God answers prayer. Um, and I suppose most Christians would agree with that, but we look for more direct intervention. So in other words, we pray for healing. We pray for deliverance. We pray for protection. And we expect to feel the presence of God, to experience the presence of God. Gotcha. So instead of just a purely mathematical and theocratic, you know, you've checked all the black and white boxes, you kind of not only just have a relationship with God, but a personal experience. Yes, with that's God. correct. All right. Awesome. Awesome. So what, what is there anything that, I, I guess, aside from that, that differs you from mainstream Christianity? Well, uh, our particular group called the United Pentecostal Church International, we're a branch of the larger Pentecostal movement, which uh, I think most people are familiar with the term Pentecostal or charismatic today, because it's probably the most rapidly growing movement in Christianity. And it has many, many different branches or segments, but probably now second only to the Roman Catholic Church in the numbers of adherents around the world. However, our particular uh, segment is called the Apostolic Pentecostal or Oneness Pentecostal. And so what makes us different is we don't look at the development of doctrine, say the third century, the fourth century, the fifth century. So we don't use the, the doctrine of the Trinity as three different persons in God. We believe in the classic uh, teaching of the Bible that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, 
but we emphasize that these are simply different manifestations of one God. And we are, when we baptize people, we baptize in the, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ because we believe Jesus is the incarnation or manifestation of that one God. So that kind of sets us apart from other Christian groups with this emphasis on what we call the oneness of God and the identity of Jesus Christ. Okay, perfect. So let's, I don't want to get too much into the weeds there because this is kind right. of going to be the, uh, I think we've got the idea generally. Now let's say there's somebody who most of my audience has accepted into their hearts the gospel of freedom. Where might they use a bridge to extend then to the gospel of Jesus Christ or, or uh, into the Pentecostal church? Sure. Well, of course, uh, I would say this: the whole concept of freedom, liberty, democracy is really based in the Bible, the Judeo-Christian ethic. If you look at the founding of of our nation, the United States of America, it's founded on this concept of, of freedom of conscience, freedom of choice, individual liberty. The classic statement from Jesus himself in the Gospel of John chapter 8, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. Uh, and of course, we apply that first and foremost spiritually, that we're, we're set free from sin, we're set free from uh, false ideologies, from bondage. But of course, if you believe that in terms of conscience and freedom of religion, then that extends to freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, uh, freedom to make your own choices. If you have freedom to control your own labor, then that implies you have freedom to uh, purchase what you want with your own, your own labor. And then that implies that you have private property. And so I do think that all the classic uh, freedoms of Western civilization really derive from this foundational freedom of conscience. Awesome. Yeah, there, there's uh, the the ability to own property is something that is not often seen as like a biblical perspective, but you know, fr from a biblical perspective, it's something that we say the Constitution gave us. But the founding fathers kind of say, well, this is something that God gave us. We're just kind of extending it to you. Exactly. That, that's exactly. Of course, that's the way our country was founded. The unalienable rights that. Uh, predate government. So what government doesn't give, government cannot take away. Yeah, they, they uh, yeah, inalienable, that, that God gives it to you from birth, that it can't be separated from you. It's indivisible from yourself. So somebody who loves these rights, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, maybe that's a good place to start. Sure. Um, wh where, where are some of those, I guess, stories that you have either personally experienced or, or things that you just are aware of doctrinally when somebody is looking and, and you don't even just have to talk about Pentecostals, but just Christianity in general or, or Protestantism in general, wh what's something that you see is like, this is may, might be a place to start. If you find that type of thing, intriguing, these rights to life and Liberty and, and pursuing your own ends. Well, I start with the individual, um, that, in Christian theology generally, um, and in Pentecostal uh, teaching more specifically, each person has his or her own relationship with God. So if God is the creator, he created each of us. And while we're part of a, a society and part of a family, uh, we each are accountable to God for our own actions. So we believe that one day we stand before God in judgment, um, not based on our affiliations or based on our friends or family or people that are, have significant influence, but we have our own relationship with God. So that uh, lends itself to a high degree of accountability, uh, but also a high degree of freedom that uh, God is the one who's given me this freedom of choice. It's my responsibility to, to exercise it appropriately. And it's uh, as long as I, and of course this gets into the rights of others because we are in a society, we're not just individuals. But the basic idea is, as long as I'm not infringing on other people's rights, then I should have the right to do what I choose. Uh, so that's the, that's the philosophy of it. Now, as it's applied personally, as a church, of course, we're interested in helping people. So we see people that are bound or addicted or their lives are messed up in various ways. And we believe that through the gospel of Jesus Christ, we can uh, minister to them uh, their own ability to find God have the power of God and with God's spirit in their lives, they can then make right choices. They can overcome, whether it be a personal addiction or whether it be uh, something that comes from their past, their childhood, their upbringing, a dysfunctional life, that they're not forever bound 
are predetermined by those negative things in their life. But with God's help, they can overcome those obstacles and freely choose a, a good life. This is something that I, I definitely wanted to get into, uh, especially with you, because you have a higher theological understanding. Uh, libertarianism is best summarized as don't, don't hurt people, don't take their stuff, right? <laughs> that, that, that if you had to be very simple about it, and it sounds like you've touched on that. I think one of the major hindrances for if you're a liberty lover, re, you know, reaching out to a a someone of faith is they said, well, I've kind of rejected all authority anyway. Why would I accept? Why would I want an authority figure, a God authority? I've gotten rid of all my government authority in, in my philosophy. Why would I accept a God authority? I think it, it, it fits in here because you're talking about gaining freedom over things that, that, you know, due to God's authority, you want to seek th freedom from like drug addiction or, or, or yes. you know, and that type of yes. thing. Yeah, you can expand on that. Yes. Now, let me explain. So I, I would not necessarily uh, identify myself as a libertarian per se. Sure. Uh, and of course, my view, since I believe the Bible is God's word, I believe it gives us a guide for life. But where I would uh, intersect with the libertarians, I be, believe very strongly in freedom of religion, freedom of conscience. So what I might believe for my life, and as a pastor, what I, what I might teach my church to follow, I'm not trying to impose that on society. And when I teach that to the church, that's up to them to decide. Uh, if, if they want to follow this guidebook for their lives, the Bible, then here's what I recommend. But if they choose not to follow that, well, that's between them and God. So, uh, but if, you, if you're wanting me to explain, okay, I'm talking to a libertarian, as you just mentioned, Here's how I would draw this analogy. I believe the Bible contains spiritual laws that are true. For example, the Bible says you, you reap what you sow. And so if you do evil deeds, uh, sooner or later, that's going to catch up with you. And if not in this life, it'll catch up with you in the life to come. So when I try to tell you to do good deeds, it's not trying to control you. It's not trying to force you. It's not a dictator. It's not a theocracy. It's trying to do what's best for you. I'm trying to advise you. If you live a life, say, of lying and stealing, uh, you may get rich. You, you may be successful in society, but sooner or later it's going to catch up with you. And if not in this life, in the judgment. And so it's in your own best interest to make this choice. Now, if you agree with me, but then you face your own sinful desires, your own sinful nature, well, the, then I offer the solution. God's power can set you free from the negative aspects of your own nature or your own inclination, your your sinful desires and lust, and enable you to do what's best for you. So I would make an analogy. It's like, like the law of gravity. Uh, now you could say, well, I'm a libertarian. I don't believe in the law of gravity. But if you jump off the cliff, gravity is going to be there whether you believe in it or not. Well, I think spiritual laws are like that too. So if you say I'm a libertarian, I want to lie, steal if I want to. As a political statement, I will say, well, as long as you don't hurt other people, I mean, that's up to you. Uh, but when you steal, of course, obviously you are hurting other people. But if you want to live, say, an immoral life or our despicable life, evil attitudes, and you're just hurting yourself, well, that's your choice. However, just like the law of gravity is a physical law that's going to hurt you whether you believe in it or not. So if you live an evil life, that's going to end up hurting you whether you believe in those moral teachings or not. Eventually, they're going to catch up with you. So I'm not trying to force you to live a life that you don't want to live. I'm offering you a way out because I really believe this is the best life for you. There's a very good uh, uh, modern tie into this uh, since you know COVID-19 is going around. You actually just got off a, a conference call with President Trump, Vice President Pence, and Franklin Graham and yes. talking with them about uh, acting intelligently during this times. And, and I, I read what you had to, to, uh, to say about it. And, and I thought it was great because I think it's saying, look, government has overstepped many, many times during this COVID-19 crisis. But when somebody offers you good advice, maybe it doesn't matter who it comes from. It, it's okay to just say that that's good advice, you know, whether it's a government figure, religious figure, and, and, and maybe this is kind of the tie in here is to say, if that, if God's law strikes you as freeing you in your life, you can actually practice God's law before even giving your heart over if that's something that you're resistant to, that you can say, well, you know, there's certain promises that, that the Bible affords when they say that the gospel affords when they say, you know, try this and, and you'll experience it, these benefits. And so it's something you can, I think people have to say, well, convert and you'll find out later. 
when the reality is, is you can actually live the life and find out that these are good things, that getting off of drugs and, and not drinking excessively can have benefits to your life, regardless of whether God tells you to or not. That's correct. Uh, yeah, I believe these principles work, um, even, even if you don't fully believe, but if you follow them, you're going to be blessed as a result. Yeah, I believe it's called a, I am always have to be careful when I say this, Christian hedonism, not heathenism, but hedonism that right. God gives you laws to help you and set you free, not because they're arbitrary and he feels like watching the, you know, kicking the anthill and watching you run around. Exactly. Now, now you're going to, you know, as a Christian pastor, I believe you, you should have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm not going to deny that at all. Oh, yeah. You should yeah. with the Holy Spirit. But I will say, yes, God's guidelines, or if you want to think of rules, are not meant to be arbitrary, punitive, uh, you know, uh, a God that doesn't want you to have fun. So he's punitive. He's that's not it at all. God's plan is the best plan for our lives. And so we're the one that's blessed most of all when we follow it. Oh, yes. And, and my intent is not to, at all to say, you know, to try and broaden this. It's like you can be a acting Pentecostal without giving your heart over to right. Jesus Christ. I know that there's some uh, uh, what, what, quantum physic type, uh, w w you know, <laughs> pseudo pseudo religion, pseudo science that kind of deals with that. I'm, I'm not at all trying to get into that. I understand that that at some point you do have to commit your heart to be to, you know, to Christ to become that. Sure. But there are things that we we take on faith. There are things, uh, I mean, even the Bible that we find out that God's not big on saying why in the scriptures. And it is always something that has, as a very left brain pensive person, makes me frustrated because I just say, can't, why can't you say why? And he doesn't often tell you, but you find out right, why. Sometimes even after, I mean, even after Christ and the apostles are martyred, you find out why he had the, the doctrine of uh, non-resistance because Christianity makes a comeback, but you don't know that at the time. At the time, you're just saying, guys, we're dying here, and Christianity looks, we're kind of on the ropes here, you know? <laughs> and you find out later that that these laws and these reasons, you know, were, were strong, but you might not find out in your lifetime. So there is a time when faith plays an important role. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, so, so to continue on, is, is there anything that uh, you you would say in your personal life that has helped you become more, uh, more, more free when you've been in touch with, with something that, you know, as far as personal experience goes, cause we could talk about doctrine all day, but just any type of testimony you have with something you said, this really affirms that God likes freedom, that God likes liberty or individualism or any, any aspect of liberty. Well, as I said, we believe that, the, that each individual should have a personal relationship with God being filled with God's spirit. So there's something very powerful and liberating. Yes, I, uh, of course, I, I have all this um, training and training as a lawyer that I entered the ministry. So I'm a very logical person, uh, oriented logically. Um, I'm, I'm skeptical of mystical things. Having said that, I can personally attest that, that I do have a personal relationship with God. I've received the Holy Spirit. There are times in prayer or in worship, when I feel the intense presence of God, I do speak in tongues, and that liberates me beyond just intellectualism. Because uh, when you follow intellectualism, you know re you can reason things, but you can never come to an absolute conclusion based on reason alone. Because humans are more than intellect; uh, they include intellect. So I would be against anyone that tries to use religion to deny or minimize reason or intellect, but we're more than that. And there is an emotional component. There is a spiritual component. And I've found that when I open my life to the realm of the spirit, even when reason cannot provide certainty, faith gives me clear direction to go forward. If I use a simple analogy, I'm happily married. I love my wife. She's very beautiful. But just on an intellectual basis, can I prove that I should stick with her only? Uh, it's more than intellect. It's a commitment. It's based on love. And so that frees me from having a constant maneuver. Well, should I choose this person or that person? Should I choose this action or that action? I could argue all day about what's appropriate or what I could get away with or what's best for me. But because I made certain commitments and I have a certain relationship, that settles a lot of questions for me. Uh, and it enables, it liberates me to move forward and use my... Uh, intellect and whatever in a, in a productive way instead of endlessly dithering about things that are that are no longer 
uh, applicable. I, I hope that makes sense. But I, what I'm saying is a, a solid commitment and relationship with my wife, and I use analogy relation with God, settles a lot of things in my life so that I can move forward in a productive fashion. Right. The You know, this is something that I've thought that... that uh... I struggled with this when I was growing up. I just figured the smartest people would believe in the right religion. And I, I looked at the top 10 smartest people to uh, take the IQ test and they're all over the board. I think, you know, three or four of them are Christians, but they're not even the same type of Christians. And, and you know, there's an atheist on there and there's a, you know, Shinto was the smartest one ever. And I just, and, and I was like, well, I th figured, I thought we all should be coming to the same realization if we're all smart right to say that oh there's one way but god doesn't say i'm like you know the, the way forward with him is the highest level of, of intelligence it's that he says you know god is love and love that is something that people actually do kind of have an understanding on when we say well yeah uh, c.s lewis talked about uh, why even in nations that adopt Christianity or don't, you don't kick somebody out of a chair if they're sitting in it first. There's kind of an understanding there and you develop these loving things. People with an high, a high EQ tend to arrive to the same conclusions even when people with high IQs don't, if, if that kind of backs up a little of what you're saying. Sure, sure. Yeah, and I'm not again against intellectual. Yeah, I, I think there's an anti-intellectual movement that that is troubling. And sure. I, I don't think it's acting against reason, but it's certainly not saying I am going to only trust in the uh, what walk walk by faith, not by sight. Right? I'm going to trust only by sight and just completely ignore faith. You know that that gives you a very limited scope in the world. You know, you yes. eventually have to trust something. Um, I think there's certain difficult issues, especially e even for libertarians like uh, like global warming. And we just say at some point we need to trust a scientist that has done more work than we've done about it. And it's hard because we tend to be very mistrustful of authorities on, on, about anything, whether it's government or, or, or religion or even global warming, you know. And so, yeah, there, there's a. Uh, there's an understanding there that, that at some point you do have to put your faith in, in the right people. It's just a matter of, of choosing the right people. So what, to get back on the subject then, what would you say makes you place your trust in God, the, the Christian God? What are some type of things that you say to somebody who is a a moral, a religious, you know, just kind of agnostic, maybe, what would you say to somebody that says this might be a good reason for you to sure. kind of place your faith in God? Well, I, I will be candid to say that um, my parents were missionaries in Korea. And so I grew up in an environment where I saw firsthand the dedication, the commitment, and the miracles that took place. So experientially, I understood and believed in God more than just intellectually reasoning my way into God. However, I came to the U.S. at age 17, so I was separated 7,000 miles from my parents and immersed at Rice University in Houston, one of the top private schools in the nation, then the University of Texas at, at Austin, one of the top uh, public universities in the nation. And so I, for seven years there, I was immersed in you know, secularism, intellectualism, uh, every kind of belief system. So I had to ascertain for myself what I believed. And several things that I've come to the conclusion. First of all, the, the fact that we exist and no matter how you explain our existence as humans, you know, evolution or cosmology, at the end of the day, you have to say, why, why does the universe exist? And, and you either have to say, well, uh, it's always been existing, eternal, or there was nothing and then there was a big bang and then something came out of nothing. Or you say God created it. And if, if you think about those three alternatives, each one are acts of faith. Uh, it's just as incredible to believe in an eternal universe as an eternal God. It's just as incredible to believe in a self-creating universe than God who created the universe. So if you look at it from that perspective, it's, it is a choice of faith. But it's a very reasonable faith to believe in God. And we could go on at length, but when you study the fine-tuning of the universe, the ultimate improbability of a universe that's capable of sustaining life, it seems much more logical to say there is an intelligent designer who created us for a purpose than to say it's so improbable that we would be here. It's like a, 
you know, one in a trillion, trillion, trillion possibility. And of course, the atheistic scientist has to say, well, there's there are multiple verses, universes. There are trillions of universes. So the fact that we are in this one trillionth uh, of a uh, of a possibility is really a matter of probability. But notice what that says. In order to evade that there's only one universe and therefore God must have created it, you have to say there are trillions of universes. And so it just so happens that we're accidentally here. Well, now you've just compounded the problem. Instead of explaining how one universe began, you have to explain how trillions of universes began. So there's the or argument from origin that, that why believing in God is quite reasonable, probably more reasonable than any of the alternatives. But then second, I would say the moral argument. Every human being has a moral sense. And even though that has to be informed by teaching and therefore it may vary across cultures and religions, every human being has some basic concept of right and wrong. Even toddlers, um, when they begin to verbalize, they talk in terms of right and wrong. Children, when they play, that's not fair. They will even tell their parents because they have a moral sense, a sense of justice. Um, if I tell you that a lion uh, in the savanna ate a gazelle uh, or a lion killed another lion, we don't think of imprisoning that lion and executing him. That's just what animals do. But when I say one human killed another human without cause or one human ate another human, we say there's something wrong with that picture. Why? Because we have a moral sense. Where did that come from? I would argue it comes from God. Uh, and, and I could give other arguments, but then the, the practical side is when we pray and seek God, then God answers prayer. God reveals himself. God enables us to experience his power personally. And so there's the experiential argument. We have the theoretical argument, but then it is uh, matched by the experiential argument. In other words, Here's the theory of what God does or what God could do. Here's the experience of what God has done. And over the years, I've talked to many people like that and asked them to pray and seek God. And I have many testimonies where they came back to me and said, yes, you, I believe God is real, not just because you convinced me by intellectual argument, but because I prayed and I've experienced him for myself. These ingrained senses of right and wrong is something that I, I did want to get into because I think that it, it, it is so important, you know, when, when we as, you know, when libertarians tend to say, you know, right or wrong, that is dictated by a, a government entity so much of the time, legislating morality, and that that's their job is to, to make sure that, that they legislate the, the, so what, what you should and should not do when we hope that deep down in our hearts that we know what is right and wrong and we choose to do what is right and wrong simply because it, it's within our souls. And there's occasionally societies that pop up that, that make us doubt this, that see uh, slavery pop up in, in maybe a non-government way, just people being people. Uh, how, how would you explain these wrongs you know, that, that crop up when because I think that that's something that both of us want to help help explaining, right? Well, why would why would these tremendous evils in human and human interactions come up when we know in our hearts or feel something in our hearts that this might be the wrong thing to do? Well, let, well, I will go back to Christian doctrine. It says humans are sinful; that God did not create us that way, but we fell into sin. And I think it was the Christian writer uh, G.K. Chesterton that said the only Christian doctrine that can be empirically proven is that humans are sinners uh, because everyone, even if you don't accept the Bible at all, you don't accept law at all, you have a conscience. And I dare say there's no one who can sincerely, honestly say, I've never one time violated, violated my own conscience. Not what the government says or not even what a religion says or not what other people say, say. Have you ever done anything that you in your heart believe was wrong? And I think everyone says yes. And so the short answer is humans are sinful. That's why we need government. And wasn't it Madison who said if, if men were angels, we wouldn't need government. So again, this goes back to American government and to libertarianism that government does not give you rights, but government is there to, to protect the rights you already have. And the reason why you need government and the reason why you need limited government and the reason why you need checks and balances which of course the American system is based on, is because you cannot trust any human or any group of humans with absolute power. 
no matter how good their intentions, uh, they're going to misuse that power. And so, you know, look at communism. In theory, it sounds like the best possible system because everybody gets what's fair. In reality, though, you're depending on a group of people to decide for the whole society what's best. And, and the point is, you cannot ever trust any individual or any group of individuals to do what's best. Even with the best of intentions, that power needs to be limited and that power needs to be balanced. Um, so that comes directly, by the way, from the Christian doctrine of the sinful nature of humanity. Uh, really, our American system of government is based on that fact. So um, what I would say is in, everybody does have a conscience. Every society does have a sense of right and wrong. Uh, but let me point this out too. We can't really depend on government to control us. You, know, you can have all the good laws like don't, don't steal, but there, you cannot have enough police to enforce that if the whole society is persistently immoral. You're depending on 99.9% .9 of people believing that and following it because they think it's the right thing to do. And government, like the police system and the court system, is only for that small minority that for whatever reason are gonna violate those norms. But if the whole society didn't have that norm, there's no way you could enforce laws. Right. You'd need over half of the population to be working in the police field or, or so you know, so <laughs> field. Sure it on the other half. Just yeah. field. Right. Right. The uh, I, I'm pretty sure I, I, I know I'm I'm I, we're live and, and but I can almost hear the uh, the the standing ovations you're getting when you talk about absolute power crushing people just slowly. You know, we, we have these beliefs and these loves. And I think we look at the biographies, even among the early communists is some of them who we believe might've been pretty genuine, but just power catches up to them and just, just kind of squashes them. So that leads me to a, to kind of a, and it's a question, even I as a theologian struggle with, we have this kind of innate sense of doing right and wrong. And yet when you say we're also born sinful, that that's so true. I think I, you know, when I see little kids, I see them you don't really have to teach a kid not, you know, to, to, to lie. He will re recognize trouble and lie right. to get out of it. That is, that just or seems to be selfish. You don't or to have be to self teach a child uh, to be selfish. You have to teach them to be kind and generous. Right. So, so what's kind of that balance when you say we're all born with a conscience and we're all born with this sinful nature, where does each of those things come from in, in, uh, in, I guess, from your understanding, where do those things sure. come from? Well, Romans chapter 7 deals with this very thing. It says, there's the law of my mind, which I know to do what's right. But then there's the law of sin, which causes me to do evil, things that I know are wrong. And then there's a law of God that tells me what's right. So then you've got these three laws in competition or these three principles. God's law saying, here's what's right. The law of my mind, which even if I don't know God's law, I do believe there's a certain law of the mind. Uh, but then even your law of the mind can give a sin. So God's law says, don't kill, don't steal. Your own conscience could say, yeah, that's right. I shouldn't kill someone without cause. I shouldn't steal someone's property. But then there's a law of sin that says, but I want to do that. I want to take that person's property. And even if I can't do it, I can envy them. Or, you know, I, I hate this person or this person did me wrong. I'd like to kill them. I know I can't do that, but I can hate them. And of course, the New Testament says, well, even if you hate someone, that's wrong. Or even if you envy, that's wrong. So there's this law of sin. Well, then Romans chapter 8 gives the solution. It says the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So I would say by trusting in Jesus Christ, accepting his uh, sacrifice for our sins, which delivers us from the penalty, and then being filled with his spirit, that gives us power. So now what God's law tells us is the right thing to do what our own conscience tells us is the right thing to do. And through study, uh, hopefully those converge. Uh, but then now the spirit inside of us from God enables us to fulfill God's will. So that's the ultimate solution to the human problem of sin is the power of God. Yeah, I mean, by the law, you're condemned, right? And this is yes. this is one of the things that if we try to hold ourselves to the law, if, if we've sinned once, we failed and... The right. wages, and we get the wages of sin, right? But we want the yeah. we want the, the other example way. Example I use: if if you are speeding on the the freeway and the policeman stops you, um, and you're obviously guilty, well, he can't. 
I mean, he could probably give you a warning, but he can't really exonerate you. So the law is good. The law is great. If everybody would follow the law, we'd all be much safer. But when you violate it, now you're outside the law. Now all the law can do is give you a penalty. The law can't really help you. The law can only hurt you. I mean, you don't tell the, the that policeman, give me justice, give me justice. No, you don't want justice at that point because justice means you're going to pay the price. So the law, even though it's great, can't help you. And, and I think this fits very well with libertarianism. The law is good. The law is necessary. But ultimately, you can't live. Society can't be successful just be out by the law. There must be something more. There must be something in the human heart. Yeah, and Shane brings this up on Facebook. Government is usually a trailing indicator. Not yes. it's not the leader. Usually, government is reactive. They don't, exactly. you know, they don't get rid of racist laws until the country has, by and large, abandoned racist laws until the yes. culture has left that. And so, if you're waiting for government to lead and do something good, it can't you're, do it. You're asking it to be a savior, and government, by definition, cannot be your savior. And that's the problem with liberalism as, you know, modern liberalism. It's well-intentioned. It's got great goals, but it's trying to get the government to do something or the law to do something that's really not designed to do. And, and of course, I, I am against, you know, I think we should have laws against racism. But to, to think that's going to be the solution is to miss the point. Right. And this is this is kind of why I'm doing this entire series. I see some people asking asking this this question while we're going here is say like, well, what's the why are we why are we having this conversation? Really, my my goal is to give people a variety of perspectives on things that they can do to fix themselves. I think some might say culturally, but I think there is a spiritual part of a person, even psychologically, we recognize that there is a a spirit to humanity that is different from the rest of the animal kingdom. Yes. Uh, I mean, I would assume you'd agree with that, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and so the, the, there's things that we can get in touch with there. Whereas we, we look so often to government for leadership for, you know, these things are regardless of, you know, you and I can have a, a friendly debate, you know, about whether government should exist at all or not, or whether these anti-racist laws should exist or not, or their purpose. But I think ultimately, what unifies us is to say that's still not our starting point isn't changing the law our starting point is changing our hearts is changing ourselves and then changing our communities and then yes. letting that and then letting the government you know whether it exists or not you know uh, kind of deal with that after effect by saying well we have a people here that value life so we have to create a government that values life if we're to exist at all Right. Yes. The law is the minimum requirement. From a Christian point of view, we live by love. Jesus said all the law can be summed in two commandments, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. And I will point this out. If you follow the law of love, that causes you to, to live above the law. The law is like a minimum safety net. So if I'm really angry with someone and I, I want to hit them, maybe the law restrains me because, hey, if I do that, I'm going to be punished. But you can't live your life just by law. So if I get angry at my wife or my children, if the only thing that's restraining me is the law, I'm not going to have a very good marriage or a very good <laughs> home life. But if I have love, then love checks my evil impulses to say, wait a minute, I love my wife. I love my children. I, I love my neighbor. Maybe not to the same extent, but I respect and care for and value my fellow human. So I'm not going to do something against him or her. Not because the law restrains me, but because the law of love is even stricter than any other law could be. And that's really the solution for the human race. Yes, you must have laws, you must have government and society, but that's only a minimum requirement. That's only an absolute safety net when everything else has failed. But you really must have higher motivations in order to have a successful relationship and a successful society. An example from the the Bible you may be aware of. I, 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 this one always stuck with me that that Jesus one time was talking to the Pharisees, of course, who are trying to kind of they're always trying to get them right, always trying to get them on yes. a technicality. And there's there's two great laws. You know, one is is going to church on on the Sabbath and not deviating from that. And I guess not church, but the temple. You know, sure. uh, keep it keeping their sacraments and, and not not deviating. From, from that course. And then in the other, there's a, there's an ox that will drown if they don't do something about it. 
And Jesus, and most of the time, I find him very tongue in cheek when he's dealing with the Pharisees. He uses a little humor, a little sarcasm, some usually some great symbolic examples. But in this case, just kind of says, you know, these these two these two laws aren't are both under the law of love. They're not meant to right. contradict each other. So, what is the more lev- loving thing to do? Probably not letting your ox drown. Right? The the okay. ox and the mire exception is the one that he gives. And of course, the Pharisees are like, "Oh, look at this. He doesn't. You know, he, he's fine with, you know, ditching church to to save your own stuff." And he's like, "Well, this is a living thing. You know, you can't." And I think at some point, like you said, that kind of goes back to the conscience that that. The, the reason law is underneath love, it is subject to that, is because you can't, even two well-intended laws in this case, going to the temple and saving your cow, you know, you, you, you know, they don't conflict, you know, you should, you should try to do both. And if you have to make a judgment call that you kind of judge for yourself what is right and wrong. Yes, there's the spirit of the law. And so as a practical, very something very practical, you cannot write enough laws to fix all problems, to close all loopholes, to anticipate every situation. So that's why you have to have an underlying spirit of the law. What's the purpose that we're really trying to convey? And this is the conflict that we see in the court systems all the time. Here's the letter of the law, but here's the intention of the law. And in some unusual case, sometimes you have to maybe go against the letter of the law to fulfill the true intention of the law. And that's what Jesus was saying. You know, yeah, the law says to take a day of rest, not to work on the Sabbath, to honor God. That makes sense. So you don't go plow with an oxen, that with your oxen, that would defeat um, the law. But what if that ox is fallen into the ditch? Well, obviously, even though technically it might seem like work, pulling that ox out of the ditch is the more kind and loving and helpful thing to do that fulfills the true spirit of the law. Yeah. Spirit of the law is kind of, it's, it's the spirit of what it, I guess what it should be, you know, and I, I guess because of my audience, I think if there's a bad law, then you break that law. You know, we, we have, that's something that we kind of stand by and, and, we recognize that maybe the law, you know, as libertarians, we believe in at least limited, some are no government, some believe in limited government, but at the very least that sometimes the government will suggest something that's just a bad idea, you know, or, yes. or, or you know, segregation was legal and all these other things were legal. And even the spirit of that law is still bad. You know, you should go right. with the spirit of, I guess, I guess uh, the spirit of love as opposed to the spirit of law when yeah. you look but, at But even then, aren't you appealing to some higher law? You're not just saying be lawless in, in, a, in a, the fullest sense. You're saying there's something... There's a law that's more uh, valuable or more meaningful than what this this particular piece of legislation may say. That's a great point. That yeah, it's 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 uh, there's something that's more important, I guess. That that uh, yeah, comparing laws, God's law or, or, and and spiritual law versus human laws, which always have to be subject to God's law. If if you yeah. if you are that type of believer, that that makes sense to me. That makes sense. I, I, it's a good way to think about it. So if you were to uh, draw up a, a sermon and, and just say, you know what, uh, there's, there's really a story that I think that, that you libertarians should know about. What, what story do you look at in the Bible that you, might, that you might start with? So what comes off the top of your head? Well, there are so many stories that, uh, that I could say. But I was thinking earlier of the parable of the Good Samaritan because I think probably that's a mm-hmm. very familiar story to many people, even if they're not Christians. But you you know the story of here was a man that was traveling on the road and uh, he was attacked by thieves. He was beaten, uh, robbed, left for dead. And on the way, uh, on the road, a Levite came, which is a temple worker. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was he knew he had to do his work at the temple. And so he couldn't stop to help this person. He passed him by. Then a priest comes by and he has worked through a temple. He can't be late. So he passes him by. And then a Samaritan comes, which is very significant because in that culture, the Samaritans were seen as heretics. They weren't pure Jews by race or by creed. And so uh, a true Jew felt like they were heretics, compromisers, uh, despised. And so, you you know, this would be like, uh, so Jesus using this person as the hero of the story, uh, maybe to a modern Christian audience, it was be like saying, well, a Muslim came by or an atheist came by. And this is the one who helped 
the, the man and, um, you know, brought him to an inn and, and, and uh, doctored him up, but then told the innkeeper, um, you keep him until he's well and whatever, here's some money to cover it and whatever is lacking, I'll pay it uh, later. And so, uh, so Jesus, you know, the, the whole story was in response to a question when Jesus said, you know, what does the law consist of? Love God, love your neighbor as yourself. And so someone asked, well, who is my neighbor? So just how far does this obligation go? Are you talking about my next door neighbor, my close friend? And basically Jesus said, whoever's in need. And so even if it's a heretic, even if it's a person of another race or creed that you despise or you think would not be suitable, um, love requires you to reach out to your fellow human being. So that would be a good place to start because Christianity does teach love your neighbor. That translates into love your fellow human being, love the person who is in need. And notice the law dictated that the religious workers need to be at, needed to be at their post of duty to worship God. So the law couldn't solve this problem. Uh, but the higher law of love, which is what I'm talking about, uh, reached out and solved this problem. And of course, you can see in that parable the, that Jesus may be the person who is despised, but he reaches down to save the helpless person. You can also apply it to ourselves. That Christians should have that same attitude of reaching to the needy, spiritually, physically, and every other way. But it's not the law that can do that. It's not the system that can do that. It's not the culture that can do that. It has to be the higher law of God's love. I love that. Yeah, the 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 example of the neighbor is perhaps the most unneighborly example, you know, that yes. he can that he can think of. Uh, they say the the Bible says, uh, "Greater love has no man than this that he would lay down his life for his friends." You know, talking about Jesus, and I always think right. that the second greatest love then has to be looking at those who crucified him and calling them his friends. Yes. You know, that this is the. Th that's got to be a close second. You know, I, I just think that there's so many examples of loving your enemies and making them your neighbors and making them your friends and bringing them in. This is something I'm sure you have unique perspective of because you have such a international presence, you know, the, the Pentecostal church and specifically the, this, uh, the, the one, uh, oneness, I, I guess, denomination. What, what is it within the, the, Pentecostal yeah, the, church. Our particular organization uh, is called the United Pentecostal Church International. So we yeah. have about 42,000 churches, but but we're part of a larger branch, you might say, of apostolic Pentecostal or oneness Pentecostal. Yeah, but this was a lot of the goal, and this is something else that I thought that you would have good perspective on, because I think one thing that is very libertarian is is this kind of anti-nationalism that our nation is great that we have exceptions because we are americans that make us better this superhumanism this uh i mean this the whole ubermensch philosophy that that has gone from germany that was really big in russia that dostoevsky had to write about what a problem that was almost every country in the world ends up thinking they're better than every other country in the world you know and their humans are superior to the other humans what would you say to somebody who who gets that feeling of it's like, well, I'm an American, so I might be a little bit better than those guys in Germany. And here's this guy who's got this big sweeping international church. Why should I care what they're doing overseas? OK, first of all, you know, I was raised in Korea and at that time, Korea was a very poor country. And of course, its culture was extremely different, about as opposite as Western culture that it could possibly be. Uh, so I was raised in that environment as an American to be thankful for being an American, but also learning to respect a completely different culture. And what I learned, every culture of the world has its strengths and weaknesses. I learned to, to evaluate there's some things about Korean culture that I appreciate more than American culture, such as their respect for the aged or their extreme love of education. Then I learned there's some things about American culture that I appreciate more than a Korean culture. So every culture around the world has its pros and cons. And what I would say about that, as humans, we're no better than anybody else. So any kind of racial superiority or national superiority in the sense of based that we're better people, uh, that's just crazy. That's just wrong. And that's unbiblical. However, I will balance that by saying there are certain cultural values that are better than others. So just the idea of multiculturalism without reflection to say we should accept all cultures as equal and all 
all aspects of all cultures. I mean, I think every culture has some great points, but it's a culture that condones slavery or suppression of women or child abuse or child marriage or, um, you know, spousal abuse. You can't just say that culture is okay. So now here, so here's where I do believe in American exceptionalism in, in a sense. We're not better as people than anybody else, but our nation was the first I mean, we do have the oldest written constitution in the world. We have the oldest functioning democracy. Uh, and so I do think some of the principles that we're founded on are superior to some of the other principles of the world at that time, such as monarchy and dictatorship. So I think it, it, as an American citizen, we can say there's some values that we treasure that we're going to protect, that we're going to defend. That doesn't mean we're better than anyone else. That's why we've been a nation of immigrants who come, but we want immigrants who come to adopt our values, at, at least the values of democracy, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, uh, work ethic, or uh, freedom of, of work, if you will, economic opportunity. Uh, these are the things that make our nation great, um, not any intrinsic worth in us as individuals. So the, the, Culture, I think, is important. It, it's important to kind of make the delineation here. I, I, I finished watching the uh, Michael Vick doc documentary, a two-part or 30 for 30, and I, I just found that there was so much like a, well, they hate dog fighting because they hate our culture. They hate blackness. They hate, you know, and it's like, man, I, I really am so cool with so many aspects of your culture. I just don't like dog fighting. You know, it's just this one part. I'm not trying to condemn. I'm not trying to throw the baby out with the bathwater and say yes. the whole culture is bad. Certainly there's things about white culture that well, what is considered white culture that is absolutely problematic. And, and you would be right to yes, criticize it about that, you know, and I, I think you take certain aspects, you know, and say, you know, that's kind of where the, the problem is. Um, uh, you know, he's specifically saying, you know, the problem is maybe this aspect of the culture. I, I guess I don't rank cultures so much to right. say this one's better right. than others. I just, like you said, I think you kind of treat it like a buffet. You take the good. If exactly. it's not looking so good, you kind of leave it there, you know, and say it's what we're, we're going for. I tend to not want to do it on a nationalist scale. Maybe this is where it gets the libertarian me comes in is to say, I don't want the nation kind of dictating who's in, who's out. I I would love it if I could get all the people of the the right cultural mindset here, but I don't necessarily trust, there's the president now. And even if I trust the president now, I might not trust the president tomorrow right. to make that decision, right? We have, we have history that's just littered with something the great followed by something the terrible. And you just say, oh, you know, it, this guy did such a good job with it. You messed it up so bad. You know, when you fork over that responsibility, some people can handle it really well. Um, a great example, and, and I don't want to deviate too much from theology, but just real quick, that John Maynard Keynes was actually really good at Keynesian economics. It just the other guys weren't. And so when you entrust that type of government power over your economy, you have to hope that the next guy is as good as the last guy, too. And sometimes that baton just kind of gets a little shaky, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, l let me just to clarify, of course, yeah. I do believe in respect for authority, but I think we can't just blindly follow uh, leaders and we can't be blindly nationalistic. What I'm suggesting is let's identify some of the things that we like about America or that we think have, has made America successful. There are some fundamental values, and I think limited government is one of those. Mm -hmm. And I think in the, the 20th century, we violated that in an enormous way. So when, when I say, uh, you know, I, I want to protect those values, then I, I compare that value of limited government to the Europe of the 1700s. And I say, well, America did a better job when it was established. That doesn't mean Americans are intrinsically better than Europeans. That doesn't mean that we should blindly follow American leaders. In fact, I think it means we should hold our leaders accountable to the principles and values that we think did make a difference in our founding or in our history. And so in some cases, we will call them to, uh, to use a Christian term, repentance, or call them to go back to some values that we've identified. So. I'm not trying to rank cultures or, or even nations, but I am trying to identify what is, has been successful, what has worked 
And of course, from a Christian point of view, what do I think is most biblical and most compatible with human nature? And so again, communism seems to assume that um, that humans are angels. You know, everybody will freely share, and the leaders will be omniscient and all loving and all wise. Well, that's not human nature. So that form of government is not going to work because it doesn't correspond to human nature. Yeah, they, these. I think there's a when things become involuntary, that's kind of when you should be worried, you know. And, yes. and communism, I think, especially struggles from that. Is is when you need somebody to kind of use brute force against otherwise peaceful people, you need to kind of check it and say, maybe just a second here, maybe maybe we need to back off of this. And even if you're a communist, I think be voluntary about it. Form a right. commune, say, come on yeah, in. That's what you, know, you want. I, right, yeah. exactly. Okay, we're on the same page there. Well, we're in the last like five, 10 minutes-ish, and I did not want to leave without you getting any last words, anything that you feel didn't get touched on. I, I always love to leave the guests with, with kind of their final thoughts on it before they go, or even if you just want to talk about getting in touch with you or your work or, you know, just, just any of that, but you've got, you know, five, 10 minutes. If you want it, if you want 30 seconds, I'll, I'll yap. <laughs> okay. Well, certainly if you're interested in some of my books, uh, they're all available at uh, pentecostalpublishing.com. And if you're interested more about our, our particular organization, upci.org. And uh, I started a church in Austin, Texas, which is uh, a wonderful city. Um, and built a large church there. It's called New Life Austin. Uh, so you can see that at newlifeaustin.com. But I think one point that maybe I want to cover in closing, obviously we're all dealing with the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I've gotten questions about, well, where's the role of the church in this? And the government's trying to shut down services. And I do believe that freedom of religion, freedom of conscience, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of press. These are fundamental rights given by God. Government can't give them or take them away. Government's supposed to protect them. Uh, but what do you do in a, in a national pandemic of a highly contagious virus? Uh, constitutional law does allow the government to make regulations as long as it's not targeting religion, but it applies across the board to all types of groups. Uh, and as long as it's the least restrictive uh, means necessary under the circumstances. So I, I'm not a medical expert, so let's assume that what the medical experts are telling us is true. I do think it's reasonable for the government to have restrictions on the size of gatherings or the, the spacing of people, as long as it applies that across the board. Now, what we've seen is some jurisdictions have tried to single out churches. Well, you can't have service in the parking lot. Well, what do you mean? It's medical advice is being followed and you have other people going to the stores in parking lots in equal numbers. How can you do that? Uh, but, but on the other extreme, just to say, well, because it's religious freedom, the government can't have any guidance. Well, how far are you gonna take that? If there's an active shooter in the neighborhood, can the police call the church and say, hey, please lock your doors. Don't let anybody in or out. Should the pastor say, oh, I have a First Amendment right to let anybody I want in here. You can't tell me what to do. Uh, I think everybody realizes if, if, uh, this, if this COVID-19 was 90% fatal as Ebola uh, and, and yet as contagious as it is, well, we might have some of these people backing off of their desire to have a thousand people in one place in close proximity. So I do believe that we are right to be very concerned and very vigilant about any restriction of liberty. And especially in a time of crisis, because what happens, the government takes over and in a time of crisis and takes steps that we all voluntarily agree or we all understand under the circumstances is constitutionally acceptable. But then there's this mission creep or this there's this reluctance once the government is in control and never lets go of that area. So I do believe there's a legitimate concern, but I believe these concerns need to be balanced. I've been telling libertarians, if you want to prove the government right and and validate their existence, then defy the orders and get a lot of people sick. And then everybody will say, well, that right there, that's why we need big government. And that's about the worst mistake we can make as libertarians, you know, I, <laughs> that would we be got to choose our battles wisely. Right. This is one of those to say, you know, there's medical experts. Like you said, I'm not an authority on everything. We talked about this at the very beginning. 
let's defer to the correct authorities on this one. Well, well, David, thank you so much for coming on the show. Like I said, this was the first one, such a learning experience, and I really appreciate you sharing your your feelings and being able to talk about it. I, I have gotten a, a lot of rejection and a lot of fear and not wanting to talk and be political, and I totally understand, and uh, I appreciate you being the icebreaker, and, and a heck of an icebreaker you were. I, I, I didn't expect somebody half so qualified to give me the time of day, so thank you. Well, you're very kind, and I've enjoyed it, and I hope your audience uh, appreciates uh, this interaction as well. So thank you very much. Anytime, anytime. Everybody, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, David K. Bernard, you can find him at uh, upci.org and all of his work there if you're interested in the United Pentecostal Church. Uh, I can tell you firsthand they're really great about answering emails and answering questions. So so feel free to, feel free to ask there. But again, thank you so much, and everybody have a great day.